Welcome back! Welcome back to another Slammer of a video. Don't forget to smash that like button. This is me losing my mind during the launch preparation process for my level 3 rocket called Send It. Send It is a 14 kilogram rocket which flies on a CTI M1560 rocket motor to an apogee of 3.7 kilometers with a max speed of just about Mach 1. In the last video, I showed you how I designed and built this rocket, and in this video, I'm showing you how I prepped and launched it. Also, this video was sponsored by Onshape. Launching a rocket is easy. You light the motor and you cross your fingers. It's getting it back safely that's the hard part. Send It uses two sets of parachutes. The first set comes out at Apogee, and it consists of a one-foot parachute and a two-foot parachute. The second chute deploys near the ground, and it's called a main parachute. This one is a 72-inch iris chute, which means it has a little hole in the middle. The first step of the launch process is to test out these chute deployments. I would rather find out that my parachutes won't come out while we're on the ground rather than when we're at 12,000 feet. To do this, we run something called a pop test, which is where you take the parachutes, insert them in the vehicle, assemble the whole thing together, turn it on, and then fire the parachute ejection charges while you're on the ground. For reasons you're about to see, I also recommend letting your neighbors know that you're gonna do this a little bit beforehand. It's L minus one. Uh, I'm not feeling great, uh, but I never feel great on L-1, so that's kind of part for the course. Okay, so we're putting the Nomex blanket on because what we want to do is protect the drogue chutes, which are in here. Um, and then we've got a little clocking here. See this line? This is going to help us align where the shear pins go. So I've drilled those holes already. And the last thing we need is the boom juice, and I don't want to do that until we're outside. You don't want to ever connect up pyro charges until you're ready for them to like potentially fire. Okay, you'll notice I've got safety glasses on. Always have safety glasses when you're working with pyrotechnics. Put one in here. These are just little snap connectors. This goes in here. This is in. And now it's time to load it. Make sure these are all lined up. Then we'll install our shear pins. It's a toasty day in the neighborhood. A toasty day in the neighborhood. We've got continuity on Pyro Channel 1, so that's what we're gonna fire here. Three, two, one, fire. That works. With the pop test done for the drogue shoots, my friend Andrew Adams and I set out to pop test the main parachute. Acquainting myself with this camera. I need to I need to um I need to make a compilation of the number of times the the clip starts and the person behind the camera says, I am now. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the chute folded. It's pretty tight. We're gonna go a little bit tighter because um, it's not gonna fit great in the nose. We're gonna make a little Nomex burrito here into the nose cone. Gonna attach it to the clips, put it together, integrate. We're not gonna power anything on until we're ready to actually pop. There we go. I wish these were Phillips head. I think standard is the worst type of screw. Hmm. And okay. Ready? Send it. Three, two, one. Woo! Comes out. Around this time, we also weighed the rocket without propellant in it and checked the center of gravity to validate the simulations we had been running on the flight. Our CG ends up being right here. Right that's, around. That's really close. Right between the N and the D. Another important thing that happens on the day before launch is some type of catastrophic failure. This is a time-honored tradition among rocketeers. No matter what, you have to have something go really terribly wrong the day before a launch. With Lumineer, our catastrophic failure on L-1 was us frying the flight computer at 4 p.m. on the day before launch. We're gonna power on via the power hatch. Power hatch. Oh, that was a loud pop. <laughs> oh. Oh no. I smell something hot. I smell it too. Me too. I burned it. Ava. And with Send It, our catastrophic failure was that I misjudged the distance between the Aeropack retainer, which is where the rocket motor screws in, and the point on the rocket motor at which it screws in. All right, besties, this is my buddy Andrew Adams. So right now it's 7 p.m. at L minus one, and uh, I found something that I did wrong, and this happens every time. Essentially, I thought that this part went here, which it mostly does when the motor is the right size, but I'm using a motor that uses a spacer, so this part actually goes 
this, here. This far in. The arrow pack is how this thing actually attaches the fin can to the booster, and we're not separating the fin can from the booster during flight, so not if it we need them to stay yeah. together. And if this can't thread in, then they can't stay together. Then the fin can falls off, it burn out, and everybody's sad. Get a threaded rod that threads into here and sticks up. There's a coupling nut on this side. And then this will be in here, but this will stick up just far enough, and then you can thread it together. And we'll be happy. As they say in France, uh, say it with me, Oh there God, is a path to flight. my what? L3 is <laughs> <laughs> Part of this time-honored tradition is making a mad dash to the hardware store to fix the problem. Boom. Flight hardware. There's a path to flight. There's this a path to flight. This is the path to flight. Oh, can I see the forward closure real quick? Mm-hmm. So now it's recessed. This is as it's going to be in flight. Fin can goes on like that. This goes in here. And then <gasps> what we want to do, screw the motor in. So that, that's a fix. This is fixed. Back to the schedule. <laughs> With the motor attachment issue fixed, the next step of the launch process is to build the flight motor, which is a CTI M1560. A motor like this will come in several parts. A case, liner, forward closure, nozzle, propellant, and then O-rings to seal it all together. There is a whole lot of nonsense that occurs over the course of about 30 minutes of usable footage from this process, and if you want to see more of that, you can see the unnarrated full cut of the whole launch process on my second channel, which is linked in the description down below. Quiet on the set, please? Set. Can I get some? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Quiet on the set, please. We are gathered here today to assemble the CTI M1500. 1560. So the first thing we gotta do here is put the smoke tracking grain into the thing. Do these need to be totally flush? They should be pretty close. They're about a millimeter, a millimeter out. Okay, let's try this again. It's just like distributed a little differently. Yeah. Fit the nozzle to one end. Nice and snug, that's a good fit. Now they say this is pre-lubricated. I'm not so sure. Put the nozzle holder over the nozzle until fully seated. Okay, all right, we got the O-ring in. The Boston accent's fun, but I just wanna have like some usable material is the problem. All right, these are the propellant grains. It's a two grain motor in a three grain case, which means we've got a spacer. This is the point at which we put the grains into the liner. All right, so this is grain one going in. Oh, that's really hard. It says to do it horizontally. <clears throat> it's probably fine. The grain goes in. <clears throat> okay, so that's one grain in. Welcome back to Tony Pepperoni. Leans his entire body weight onto about six pounds of ammonium perchlorate composite rocket propellant. Yeah. <sighs> Here we go. Ah, Tony Pepperoni! Go! Oh. They seal it real good, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you that much, okay? I, I'll tell you that much. They seal it good. Oh, yeah. Is it working? Oh, yeah. Oh, it is work. Um, oh. Oh. I'm Tony Pepperoni, yeah. Here goes the spacer on top. Clunk. Here it goes. I wonder if this could be done with one set of hands. Yeah, this is this is the right way to do it. Here we go. Oh yeah. Mmm. Mm. The right size is that this should be. Uh, just a little bit proud or flush. And it's not quite there, but it's a little bit proud. Hold real tight. All right, you ready? We're gonna do one more big push. It's gonna be one, two, three, push. Ready? One, two, three, push. Ah. Integrated. This is integrated. We gotta do other tasks. We are not done. And we yeah. only have an hour and a half till midnight. Yeehaw. Yee 
f***ing hob. With the motor finally integrated, I inserted it into the rocket and screwed it tight. And after a little bit more packing, Andrew Adams and I completed the pre-flight checkouts for avionics and then avionics integration. The night before a launch is almost always very stressful, and you usually stay up a little bit too late because of misjudgment in time. With that said, drives out to the desert in the early morning are always exciting and filled with energy. Send it! Send it! Send it! And once at the launch site, we got to work setting up right away. The weather on the day was extremely windy, like right at the upper limit of what we were comfortable with. Fortunately, the club launch was held at the Lucerne Dry Lake Bed, which is a massive area of flat land where it's really easy to spot things at least a mile away. While the footage and audio do a pretty good job showing how windy it was, all of our simulations had been updated the day before launch with the flight day winds, so we were still comfortable flying in this amount of wind, having simulated the flight beforehand. After first setting up the ground station, I then did a quick check on continuity and power for the avionics bay. Okay, we have on telemetrum, Apogee igniter voltage is 4.19, main igniter voltage is, voltage is 4.2, so that's good. Yep. Um, and Ava has continuity on two. The bat voltage looks great. Start cameras. Yep. Start cameras. Hello. 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 Out. Packing chutes is the next step here, and as mentioned before, the main parachute is a 72-inch iris chute. It's the same main parachute that we flew on Lumineer last year, but tragically never got a chance to inflate during flight because of a whole bunch of failures. In order to pack this chute inside of Send It, we folded it really nice and tight, rolled it in a nice little Nomex fireproof blanket, and then packed it in the nose of the vehicle. Along the way, we also made it a point to tighten and torque stripe each quick link and hex nut on the rocket. Doing this helps you see after the flight if any of your connections started to twist away or back out. It also provides some assurance as to how tight your quick links are, and it helps you make sure that you've definitely closed your quick links. Anyone who's been in amateur rocketry long enough will know that a failed quick link has killed many a flight. After attaching all of the lines, we hooked up the pyro charges and installed shear pins for flight. With an actual flight instead of ground testing, I usually like to tape over the shear pins with some aluminum tape. This ensures that there's no way they could shake themselves out on the way to the launch pad or during the flight. Now, part of getting your level 3 certification, at least under Tripoli, is working with two advisors from something called a Technical Advisory Panel, or TAP. These folks are meant to help you through the design process, spot errors you might have, and as you're getting into higher powered rocketry, keep you safe. So before the flight, I headed over to check with those folks who were certifying my flight as TAP apps to make sure they were okay with the flight and that they could sign my paperwork to say it was safe for me to fly. As mentioned in the last video, we did have to make one quick change to how the vehicle gets powered on to make it a little bit safer for flight, and that was at the advisement of one of the taps at the site. But with that changed and our paperwork signed, I was cleared to go to the launch pad. At the pad, we installed the rocket on the launch rail, raised it, and then installed the igniter, which is always a stressful process. I'm always really careful to twist the leads of the igniter first so that it can't ignite if there's any rogue current across those leads. And with the rocket on the rail, we headed back to the ground stations. And this is where we ran into a problem. No, they're uh, right by the rail, which I did not consider until just now. We can launch without GPS, it's just sketchy. What about tel this telemetry map GPS? Neither has GPS. Here's the thing too, the chance that we pick it up in flight is, is pretty high. Yeah. But I have never flown without GPS. I just know that the Kalman filter can handle it, but I haven't flown without it. We have barometric for altitude. This is barometric and acceleration. This is barometric and acceleration, unless we have GPS. Your chance of losing this thing is very slim out here. Yeah. Um, like, as yeah. long as you're... Well, as long as it lands good. on the lake bed. Yes. Um, yeah. I did plenty of power on testing and RF compatibility checks while I was at my house. The one thing I forgot to do is do all of that testing next to a launch rail. This rail combined with the placement of the GPS antennas on the rocket caused enough RF interference so that we couldn't pick up any GPS signal. To be clear though, both of the computers that flew on Sendit are totally fine to fly without GPS. They're totally robust to that type of failure. They can fire all of the pyro charges and get the vehicle safely to the ground without that connection. The loss of GPS is really more about tracking the vehicle and knowing exactly where it is in like a position. If I were flying up at FAR or RRS, which is a little further up in the Mojave Desert, there's brush all over the ground and it makes it very hard to see a rocket. But on a dry lake bed where there's no vegetation and we can just look straight out, it's a lot easier to find it. So I felt a lot more comfortable flying without GPS connection and just pushing to launch. Ender, this is your official go. We have everything good on the ground. Okay, here goes, Joe. 
send it. Flying send it off pad G6. Good luck. Five, four, three, two. Read it out. Uh, I see an event, maybe? Anything? Oh, yeah! Oh, we got a drone! Yeah! yeah. Let's go! The rocket flew perfectly on the way up, and Ava got the drogue chutes out just a tad early. But learning from the lessons of Lumineer with the ripped drogue, these chutes had no problem staying together. At around 250 meters here, we popped out the main parachute and landed on the ground. Oh! That's black and orange. Okay. Where? I see it. It is straight out. Oh! Yeah. Yeah, I got eyes on it now. Yeah, okay. That thing's gonna be dragging. Andrew Adams was right here. The rocket was dragging. A whole lot, actually. In between the time that it touched down on the ground and the time that we got to it to stop it, it moved a whole 150 meters or almost 500 feet across the ground. This is because it was getting dragged by the main parachute, which refused to stop inflating because of how high the winds were that day. It took a little while for us to get to it, but the only part of the rocket that did not fare well was the onboard cameras, which popped inside of the avionics bay. This was sort of expected though, as I attached those cameras intentionally using a small amount of pretty weak epoxy because I knew I wanted to take them out later. The only downside to this was that we ultimately cracked the SD card on the up looking camera and I cannot for the life of me get the data off of it. I have tried really hard in the past to get data off of cards like this, especially in the case of Lumineer. And oftentimes even professional recovery services have said, no, we are unable to get the data off of this. This is also the moment that I decide I am never going to have another cracked SD card prevent me from getting footage off of it again. I will go to great lengths to ensure that these little cards don't crack and that I can get the footage off them in the future. It is like way too high value for me to keep losing this. That said, every other part of the flight was a success, and after getting all of my paperwork closed out, I mailed it in to Tripoli and I should, fingers crossed, be level 3 certified now. As I work towards doing a space shot in the next few years, every flight is an opportunity to refine procedures, rehearse checklists, build flight experience, etc. I know that fundamentally Fundamentally, rockets like Send It look pretty simple, especially for the things I usually build on this channel. There's no active guidance, there's no crazy control algorithms, we're just shoving a solid rocket motor into some fins and a nose cone. However, as anyone who has built a high-powered rocket knows, it is deceptively hard to build vehicles as they get larger. The bigger the rocket, the more weirdly complex it is and weirdly difficult in ways that you don't expect. So send it going three or four kilometers isn't a huge deal technically speaking, but it paves the way for some really fun flights. Now that I'm level three certified, I can buy any commercially available rocket motor. For instance, the next high powered rocket I'm building is going to go Mach 3 and hit 40 to 50,000 feet with a very special payload in the next few months. But in the meantime, it is time to talk about today's sponsor. Thank you to Onshape for sponsoring today's video. Onshape is a cloud-based CAD platform built with businesses in mind. Although it operates straight from your web browser, it is not a lightweight CAD system. Onshape has industry-leading manufacturing-specific features for sheet metal and frame-based design, as well as an easy way to create drawings and configurations. You can be sure you're always using the latest version of Onshape without the need to install it, because Onshape is pushing updates to their platform every three weeks. And with robust data management built into the platform, you can effortlessly keep track 
track of your designs while branching out using a GitHub-inspired version control system. Onshape is especially well-suited for working with teams and hybrid work, and the platform makes it easy to collaborate with anyone on the same document at the same time anywhere in the world. As mentioned previously, Onshape has been the platform I've used for several major projects in the last few years, and if you want to give it a try, you can support this channel by supporting today's sponsor. You can try Onshape for free by going to the link here or in the description down below. Thank you so much to Onshape for sponsoring today's video, and thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.